sausages cooked over an open fire. What better way of keeping you fighting fit for a freezing morning down at the range? We're just a few miles from Zeiss HQ in Wetzlar, and magazine editors from as far away as Wisconsin and Pretoria are here as guests of Zeiss Sports Optics. There's a lot to be gained from a trip like this. It allows the shooting press to keep the world up to date with developments, reinforce the quality of the kit, and see how a large traditional German hunt is choreographed. And also a chance for the British contingent, like me and Pete Carr, editor of Sporting yes. Rifle magazine, to get back into the swing of things. So this has been great practice, you know, for someone like me who, you know, I haven't shot driven game for a whole year. You don't really want to be turning up and making your mistakes on the game. So to be able to get a chance to handle the guns, to get used to the lead, get used to the, the, the pitch of the animals running and, and get a bit of practice in a safe environment to get a feel for it is really, really useful. Um, and if you're looking to travel abroad to hunt and you've never had a chance to shoot on a shooting cinema, I'd definitely recommend it. There's also an opportunity for us to carry out a comparison test and Pete thinks Zeiss's latest Victory HT red dot sight has the march on the Leica. Well, there's no comparison at all. Clearly the, 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 the clarity of the Zeiss and, and, and the red dot though, it guides the eye straight into what you're actually shooting at. Uh, there's just no comparison whatsoever. The Zeiss, one hands down. After the shooting cinema, it's time to put some rounds down the barrel. We've been given the option of using some lead-free ammunition from RWS on this hunt. Some hunting areas in Germany are already lead free. They certainly seem to be working for Mr. Carr. That's sporting rifle for you. Quit while you're ahead though, Pete. I sight in my borrowed Blazer R8 and have a go at the clays. The camera picks up the trace of the bullet as it travels down range. The following day we're at the hunting ground in Laubach. It takes six months to put together a shoot like this. 50 journalists, all with a passion for hunting, are here to experience a traditional German hunt. And with so many guns on the ground, safety is of paramount importance. The gathered high -vis hunters are told what's on the quarry list, and more importantly, what isn't. A promising or large red stag would be a very expensive mistake to make, as would shooting a mature mouflon ram. Shooting a roebuck would be an embarrassing error of judgement, especially in front of this crowd. The head forester and man in charge of looking after us is Rudiger. Rudiger, you, you are the, the hunt chief for this area in Laubach. How big is the forest here that we've been hunting in? So in total we have 4,200 hectares of forest and it's divided in 3,900 hectares which is real forest and the, the other part is open area fields, things like that. And is this a very big or a typical hunt for this area? These hunts, um, normally they have two big hunts in a year they are doing. Um, this is the biggest one. And all the other people which are helping, they are volunteers and freelancers just coming here for these two events. And they, um, as a kind of thank you, they can hunt um, with them and maybe they can take some of the meat home as a kind of compensation. We're separated into groups and head off into the forest of Laubach to be shown our home for the next three hours. There's strict instructions not to leave the high seat until the end of the drive, no matter what happens. We get comfortable and start willing stuff to appear. So it's uh, about five minutes to ten. Officially the hunt starts at ten o'clock, but uh, we are live on stand, so if we do see any animals now, we're, uh, we're good to go. But just beautiful, we're up in this high seat. 360 degrees shooting, snowy forest, peace and quiet. Just waiting for the horn and for the, the fun to start, so very, very very soon some shots ring out across the forest. It builds the excitement with a hint of envy. Then we see some movement. A road is in front. Hidden behind the trees it crouches down. We can hear the beaters getting nearer and there are a few roads darting through the forest but nothing close enough for a shot. Then the beaters and dogs appear and I put down the rifle as they mill around and regroup. It's obviously really no shooting when the dogs and the, uh, and the beaters are within sight. Um, as always with the, you know, with this kind of hunting safety first, so it's a chance to, uh, I know the road here, look that one that was couched up, that one that we saw before, 
The dogs are there to lift the game and push it gently forward, not chase it at high speed like YouTube star Fenton. Right, the idea is that because they're short-legged, they don't move very fast. They're not trying to make the game run, they're just trying to gently move it through the forest. Because obviously, you know, the faster it goes, the harder it is to shoot, and the more, you know, wound up the game gets. So, yeah, the, the dogs are pretty slow, especially when there's snow on the ground. No matter how much we will a sounder of boar to charge through the forest towards us, we don't get a shot. However, our neighbour has been more successful with a nice rodo. He isn't the only one who's managed to pull the trigger and there's a mixed bag being prepared for us. There's a lot of red deer, including this two-year-old stag with an unusual head. It was shot by Belgian journalist Reiner, who was brought up in Scotland. I've seen some stags like that in Scotland, where, there are a lot of, where the population is good. But I think over here they're normally sh they sh should be better. <laughs> the body is quite okay, but maybe something is, has happened. Normally they should have, have more antlers on their heads, but I have no idea. As is traditional, there's a ceremony to celebrate the game. Each of the species has its own piece of music, from the red stag to the red fox. All these animals are available to shoot in the UK, apart from the badger for legal reasons and the mouflon because we haven't got any. Pete thinks it's a great trophy animal. The German people now view the mouflon as a as a native species, but it isn't. It's, it's the same as what we do at home. Um, look on the fallow deer as a native species. It isn't. It was introduced, as was the mouflon. Uh, we don't have any in the UK, uh, although we do have one wild sheep species, the sower sheep. Uh, today, I think we've shot 14 today. Uh, we're shooting a half curl maximum, otherwise it was going to be big money if we uh, made a mistake and shot one. But uh, you know, it's good to see. The journalists are allowed to bring their own rifles along for these events. And for a bit of a change, Pete's borrowed a Chapuis double rifle from York Guns. How far can you accurately shoot out with a rifle this time? Well, this, I can shoot an inch group with this at 50 yards. Uh, anything past that, I'd go 60, 70 yards if, if, if I was confident uh, with, with the shot. But, you know, each shot's different. But at 50 yards, no problem whatsoever. You know, it's a cracking little piece of kit. And they're beautiful uh, looking things as well, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. From the traditional to the controversial, lead-free bullets. RWS have co-sponsored this event, supplying the ammunition. In the UK, where we're still, you know, we're allowed to use lead, that's actually changing in Europe, isn't it? There are going to be certain areas in Germany on certain hunting grounds where you're no longer allowed to use lead ammunition. Exactly. And in the past, the problem with lead-free ammunition was that it is not working on longer distances. So when velocity goes down, ordinary lead-free constructions are not working. You got kind of a full metal jacket effect. Okay, so and you then, just get penetration but no power. No absolutely, power. well, no delivered energy. And therefore, game kept on running and you had to track it for, for hundreds and hundreds of meters. And this bullet is made to be uh, working even on 250 meters without any problems. So this bullet kind of solves the problem with lead-free ammunition on longer distances. You see it on this illustration as well. Fragmentation starts and this is how it looks like when it pushes through. And it's, and it's this, this bit here that retains the weight and, and gives exactly. you your Exactly. Yep, yep, this is the defined body. Day two. There's been heavy rainfall and it's much warmer, although still cold enough for plenty of layers sitting up a high seat. A new location looks promising and I'm feeling confident. It rained in the night and there's a lot less snow on the ground. Hopefully that'll allow the animals to move more. We've seen quite a lot of fresh tracks walking from the road to the, uh, to the high stand. So there's, there's quite a positive atmosphere. I think a lot more poor in this area. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed. I do some quick range finding so I can mentally mark trees and boundaries. And it's not long before we see some game. A group of red deer cross the ride below us, but they're too fast and too far away for me to feel confident at a shot. There's a group of half a dozen hides and a spiker. They came through the heavy cover, they were quite close to us, but then they angled away. Next to show up is my own favourite, the boar. It looks big, but again it's too far out of range. It's just such a buzz though. Next to show up is a fox. I spot him early. He crosses the ride and I whistle to stop him. And he drops. Amazing, they can come from anywhere. That fox, I don't know whether it's the same one that come back up that way, but literally, you can have a game coming from 360 degrees. Just stopped on the whistle there. 
Our lone boar makes another appearance, but he's too fast. We then hear something behind us and it's another group of deer, the big stag finding it hard to keep quiet on the move. Another fox makes an appearance just below us. The 308 finds a target. He runs on, but he doesn't go far. From the same part of the wood, we get a great shot of this robot. But no mistakes here, we let him pass. The beaters show up and we down tools until they've gone through. But once out of sight, they shout back that they've spotted some reds coming our way. It's probably the same group again with the big lad. They appear on the ride and I go for the calf in the middle. But I'm not sure how well. I think so, yeah. Luckily, it's right at yeah, the end so of the yeah, drive and, and Klaus small. appears asking if we yes, need to follow uh, up on anything. Yeah. I show him the blood yeah, on the ground and he goes back to get shot. Paul, the long-haired Weimarana. This is one of the key differences between this type of hunting. Obviously, animals moving, there are some bad shots, like the one I made earlier. We found an outshot, we found some blood. And this guy is here straight away, as soon as the drive's finished, a few minutes later, here with his blood tracking dog. Um, and we've shown him where the outshot is and hopefully he's now going to go and follow up and, and find the injured animal um, as quickly as possible. And there are these guys all around the forest, so any injured animal are tracked up, dispatched as quickly as possible. And it's one of the kind of the key features of, of the driven hunt uh, that's alien to, to UK hunters. Obviously, you know, we, we have to one shot, clean kill, find the carcass. Here that doesn't always happen, the animals are running, they're hyped up. Um, but this is, you know, this is part and parcel of it, the follow-up work. The dog is shown the scent and they're off, the pair covering the ground quickly. Then Klaus spots the calf in thick cover and releases Paul. We try and stay with him and after a few hundred metres we listen for the dog. I'm glad. He's across and below from us. Klaus spots him and as we approach, David is told to hold back. As Paul bikes if he thinks he's about to be dispossessed. Klaus makes sure the deer is dead, then takes this once docile looking pooch off the carcass. He's still unhappy about sharing his deer. It's been hot work, but we have our animal. Of course I wanted it to drop on the spot. Everybody does. But at least the professionals found this one quickly and efficiently. This is very... <laughs> Back at the base, it looks like it's been another successful drive, and I have two foxes and a deer to add to the ceremony. Putting on an event like this is hard work, not to mention costly. It's interesting for us to note that yourself and Armin and Jan and Marwan are all very passionate hunters yourself. This is what you do on your weekends and for your own enjoyment as well. Yes, definitely. So me, for example, I love to be in the field to test our products. I'm one of the hardest testing people. If products survive my test, they last forever. <laughs> <laughs> and no, you are right. We are very passionate hunter and whenever we have time, then we try to join um, together and to join and follow our passion. That's the idea. And you think it's important for your brand and for your products to be driven by passionate hunters as well as by scientists? Of course. We, we need both. You need the scientists um, for the technology, but you need the hunters for the features. Because you must understand what a hunter needs, and that is what we build in our products. So optic is the one side, but make it the way that it enhances the hunter's passion. That is our target, and I think we are doing pretty well. The driven hunt is such a strong part of German and continental Europe's hunting culture, it's hard not to admire the way they do things. More and more rifle shooters in the UK are choosing to cross the water and give this style of hunting a go. And if you're lucky enough to draw a high seat that delivers, you'll never forget it. <laughs>